सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली डिड यू सी द प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स विक्ट्री लैप एट अयोध्य ऑन टेलीविजन एंड इफ यू डिड what did you think did you say to yourself wow what a victory for the vhp what a victory for hindutva or did you say to yourself you know it needn't have come to this there were other ways of doing exactly the same thing but you know it's a funny question because when i saw it both of those thoughts occurred to me yes it's a victory for hindutva but no it needn't have been done this way let me explain first of all one of the mistakes we make when we talk about hindu revivalism is to think that it was all the bjp yes the bjp in its earlier avatar the jansan has been around for a while but it was always a sort of small town cowbird party of shopkeepers it was never really a hindu revivalist party no matter what they will tell you now the person who really harnessed the hindu vote nationally for the first time was indira gandhi and it was not difficult to do because she did it during the time of the punjab crisis that was a phase when hindus were being separated from others on buses being shot in cold blood separatists were saying anti hindu things there was a degree of anger and insecurity in the hindu community and mrs gandhi harnessed it she did it cleverly she was very subtle about it she wasn't blatant like some of today's chaps and she was also very very careful to not turn into anti muslim feeling it was sort of pro hindu feeling now mrs gandhi as we know was assassinated and one consequence of that anti sikh pro hindu feeling she had engendered was a terrible massacre that followed her assassination her son rajiv then took over and he more or less rejected that whole religious platform that mrs gandhi had so assiduously cultivated a holdover from mrs gandhi's day was rajiv's cousin arun nehru who'd been one of mrs gandhi's primary advisors and sought to fulfill the same role for rajiv now arun nehru had a strategy and you can think what you like objectively but i think it was probably the right strategy if you were ruthless and committed to staying in power his strategy was the congress was already the only national party the bjp was down in the 1984 85 election to two seats it didn't count for anything now said arun nehru if we continue what mrs gandhi started and if we define ourselves as a hindu party the party of hindu pride then we are fine who can ever defeat the congress this did not go down well with rajiv gandhi basically because rajiv gandhi didn't believe in religious politics he believed in all this old fashioned stuff about a secular india he didn't believe the congress should be playing any kind of religious politics and in fact many of the things he did actually chipped away at the hindu vote that mrs gandhi had so assiduously cultivated for instance the shahbanu judgment and what he did about that the ban on the satanic verses none of these things went down well with that hindu vote bank but arun nehru who believed that he was smarter than rajiv and who believed that rajiv had got it wrong went ahead and did various things one of them was to open the locks at the babri masjid now this is the difficult one to understand now given that there's so much has happened but essentially there was a dispute at a site in ayodhya which was apparently allegedly the birthplace of lord ram there was a temple over there we were told but effectively all you ever saw was a mosque and we were told that the mosque had actually been built over the temple etc this was a dispute that went to the courts been going on for decades and the gates were shut under arun nehru and his pet chief minister in up the locks were opened now it was done through a court order so both have claimed that had nothing to do with them but we all know how these things work in india the moment the locks were opened arun nehru strategy was the congress which at that stage this is now hard to believe had the majority or a large proportion of the sadhus in ayodhya on its side would identify itself with the reclaiming of the ayodhya ram janmabhoomi 
This strategy didn't work because A. Rajiv Gandhi would have nothing to do with it and B. Rajiv and Arun Nehru fell out and Arun Nehru was thrown out of the government. But this platform was there going a begging and the man who recognized its importance was L.K. Advani. Now at that stage, the BJP had been badly humiliated. Vajpayee had lost his own seat at the last election. Advani had always been Vajpayee's number two and he decided that he was going to try and revive the BJP and he was going to revive it using Hindu issues. Ram Janmabhoomi was a perfect issue. Here's what Advani said. Advani said, this is one of the holiest spots in Hinduism. This is where Lord Ram, our God, was born. On this spot, there was a magnificent Ram temple. That temple was destroyed by the emperor, Babur. The emperor then built a mosque on that site. Obviously, Hindus were unhappy. There was a dispute. And because of that, that mosque is now unused. Namaz has not been said there for decades. So here's what we're saying. We're not saying give up the mosque or anything. We are saying move the mosque a little bit. It's not unheard of. In Pakistan, for instance, Advani said, mosques are moved all the time. If there's a road going through an area, there's new construction. It's possible to shift a mosque brick by brick to a few hundred, few thousand feet away. And that's what we need you to do. If the Muslims agree to this, I will help them. I will come myself and with my hands, I will shift the mosque. And once the mosque is shifted and there is no dispute, it can become a functioning mosque again. Meanwhile, on the land that's been vacated, the so-called Ram Janmabhoomi, we will build a Ram temple. Now, all of this was historically very dubious. First of all, was there ever a historical Ram? Secondly, was his Ayodhya the Ayodhya of today? Thirdly, was there any evidence that this historical Ram, if he did exist, was born over there? Fourthly, how much evidence was there that there was a great Ram temple before? Was it even true the Emperor Babur had built that mosque? There's no evidence that he was the one who built that mosque. So the historicity of all of this was extremely dodgy. But, said Advani, none of that matters. It doesn't matter whether there was an historical Ram or whether he was born on this spot. What matters is millions of Hindus believe that he was. This is a matter of faith, not a matter of history. If we as Hindus believe this is one of our holiest spots, then surely as Muslims, you should give us the right to respect that spot. You should go out of your way to try and accommodate us. And what are we saying? We're just saying shift the masjid slightly. We're not saying pull it down or anything. Now, again, this was dodgy. Millions of Hindus were not saying this is one of our most sacred spots. In fact, that old Babri Masjid dispute was little known in the rest of India outside of UP. Most people didn't even know that there was the Ram Janbhumi till Advani made it an issue, till the locks were open a little bit before that. But for the purpose of argument, this is what Advani said. Now, I remember talking to Advani during that period. And of course, I was bitterly opposed to any kind of communal agenda. But I had to say that the way he said it, it did not sound unreasonable. We're used now to the angry Hanuman and angry Hindutva messaging, but that was not Advani's messaging. Advani's messaging, and if you look at Advani himself, he looks a little like the common man in that R.K. Lakshman cartoon. His messaging was, I am a Hindu, a long-suffering Hindu, driven to anger by the injustices heaped on me. The Congress government has pampered the Muslims and not done anything for Hindus. Even our holiest spot is not being taken seriously. Please, Hindus, let's do something about it. And it was sort of a hand-wringing, slightly Uriah Heap-like approach, but it worked. It was convincing. There was no getting around that. So what should the Rajiv Gandhi government have done? This was the beginning of the revival of the BJP. So it had two alternatives. Alternative one was that it called Advani a communalist, said these people were jokers and did nothing. Alternative two was it said, look, there is a danger. If this Hindu stuff gets out of hand, it'll polarize communal relations in our country. It's not something we can afford. Why don't we talk to the Muslim community? Why don't we persuade them that perhaps the Babri Masjid can be shifted slightly? It would not be a VHP or a BJP enterprise. We'll put together a national movement. We'll have Muslims involved in the building of a new temple. And we'll have Hindus involved in the shifting of the Babri Masjid. We will 
have grand openings for both a new functioning masjid and a new temple. We will reduce, therefore, the role of the BJP. We will not allow Advani to hijack this. This will become a great national enterprise. This was another proposal. And which one do you think the government followed? Of course, they went with the first one. And anyone who suggested the second solution, and that was people like me, we were called communalists, anti-Muslim, to Hindutva, whatever. I was, in fact, not particularly concerned about Ram Janmabhumi or Babri Masjid, to be honest. What I was concerned about was the polarization of India. I did not think India as a country could survive as a diverse and pluralistic place if Hindus and Muslims were at each other's throats. I had been concerned about Mrs. Gandhi's Hindutva, but I was even more concerned now because if you allowed Advani's kind of Hindutva to rise, then I thought the BJP might be unstoppable. In a country like ours, where 80 something percent of the population is of one religion, secularism, pluralism only works if the majority backs it. If you give the majority the feeling, rightly or wrongly, that you don't care about what it wants, you risk that feeling. And yet, this is pretty much what the Congress did till the end when they got nervous. When Rajiv Gandhi launched his campaign in 1989 for the general election, he launched it from Ayodhya. They agreed to a shilanias at a spot which they were told was not disputed. In fact, it was disputed. So it was a complete mess from beginning to end. But not a mess for Advani because he took that Babri Masjid campaign and he built an entire new kind of BJP around it. The Congress never understood this. Rajiv Gandhi did not become Prime Minister because he was assassinated, but Narasimha Rao did. And Narasimha Rao, I think in many ways, was closer to Arun Nehru's way of thinking. People have even said he was the first BJP Prime Minister of India, but let's leave that aside. But Narasimha Rao also, because he was a veteran of Indira Gandhi's time, believed that you had to keep the Hindus happy. That was the way ahead. So he failed to protect the Mabri Masjid. One of the most shocking episodes in post-independence India, a mob pulled down the Babri Masjid and the central government did nothing. This was followed by bloody riots in cities like Mumbai. Again, Narasimha Rao slept through all of that. The consequence was that the Congress ended up with the worst of both worlds. Muslims regarded it as a party they had trusted, which had now betrayed them. And Hindus regarded it as a party that was anti-Hindu and pro-minority. And it's a mess that the Congress still finds itself in. It really is neither here nor there. So that was what the Babri Masjid thing is about. You could argue that Mr. Modi's appeal is based on more than Ayodhya. I don't dispute that. But I don't think you can argue that there would be a BJP of this magnitude or this revive if it hadn't been for Advani and the Babri Masjid issue. It was Ram Janbhumi, it was Ayodhya. That was the beginning of the rise of this avatar of the BJP. All of what we are seeing today, Mr. Modi's victory lap in Ayodhya, all of that stems from this. So let's go back to the 1980s. Let's look at the solution, the national consensus solution that people like me favored. Would it have worked? Well, I spoke to many people I knew, Muslim leaders, Sayyid Shahbuddin, for instance, leading light of the Babri Masjid Action Committee, and they were adamant they would not shift the mosque even by an inch, they said. I said, why? They said, because it's our mosque. Why should we give in to a communalist like Advani? I said, aren't you risking unleashing a more dangerous monster by refusing the small compromise? No, they said, we will not compromise. And this was pretty much the view, not just of Muslim leaders, but of Indian secularists as well. There was another objection. The objection was, if you allow Advani to say that this was a temple before it became a mosque, they will revive their demand for Kashi, Mathura, and every other mosque in India. They will keep saying there was actually a temple underneath. Let's destroy it. I said, no, if it becomes a national movement, and if Advani and the VHP are marginalized in that movement, nobody will pay much attention when they say it. And I stand by it because those de demands are still being made anyhow, aren't they? So what did we achieve with that? Those were essentially the objections to any kind of compromise solution to the Babri Masjid issue, any kind of solution that took it out of Advani's hands and made it a national issue, a national consensus, including Hindus and Muslims.
I don't know. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe this was, it was bound to go this way. Maybe for secularists, the price has been worth paying. I don't know. So what I do know is this, which is that if there had been no Babri Masjid issue, there would not have been any BJP revival. If the so-called secular establishment had not sat back and let Advani run away with it while making mistake after mistake, I don't think we'd have had the BJP in power seemingly unstoppable today. That was where it all began. Now, history is full of what ifs, but this was a major what if. This was a turning point in Indian history. You could argue that it was inevitable, that Hindus would have reasserted themselves at some stage, that perhaps I'm making too much of this. I don't think so. I think it really was a turning point. And I think myself that we played it wrong, that all of us as Indians should have made it a national issue, not allow it to become a Hindu communalist issue. But that's just one view. You may think differently.